and gentlemen, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, today I'm going to talk, I've prepared something for the both communities, uh, for the paleo, for the rain gods, yeah. and, the, uh, and for the archaeological community as well. And um, I'm hoping for critique from both sides. Um, let's, uh, you, you, you know this type of record, it's just a, a demonstration or an indication that the rapid climate change events, we, we call them rapid climate change <coughs> events, Harvey Weiss proposed to call them abrupt climate change, but I think we can, I would propose we may agree on a certain terminology. Here they're called stadials interstadials. No? I just sort of, this, you see they, they continue in the potassium record. We can see them in the Holocene, whereas the oxygen isotopes don't really show as much, um, this, this certain specific uh, GISP2 uh, record. And just as a sort of, I've been working together with Paleolithic archaeologists, and we were hoping to find the stadials, interstadials, or rather the potassium cold winters in the archaeological record. In particular, that the Neanderthals may have died out for this reason. No, uh, here's the uh, where is it? Forty thousand? No. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if they died at all, it's two thousand years earlier. So we've I've given up that research, but I haven't given up yet for the Holocene. You know, <laughs> looking for these the impact of these events. And, no? So how do we get? Oh yeah, here. No? Okay. Uh, just back back against the mechanism. So from the archaeological p perspective, we could call it. Uh, the, the, call him the, the wind god Aeolus blowing these strong Siberian <coughs> winds. Oh, yeah, one. thanks. That's very kind. Yeah. Um, here's uh, Aeolus, core LC21. So the strong winds come over here of a different corridors, but this is, first of all, the starting corridor, the main one. Cool down the, the water column in a few days, winter, spring. Yeah. It's very, very cold. Uh, we have rapidly cooling. cooling air. Um, if I remember, yes, it's the coldest air mass in the northern hemisphere. Um, and it's simultaneously recorded in this core and in Greenland on the other side of the world. No? That's, that's sort of the starting point. Here are some of the, yeah, the, perhaps the, some of the best records we have at the moment. You can see here the aid to the Hudson Bay, okay, but uh, the rapid climate change interval is an atmospheric signal, so it starts early, so we can't see in the oxygen isotope. Perhaps we can even see in Sufula. Uh, many people have sort of proposed that we can't see it. I mean, if you look at it, it's, it's not that bad, no? Then we have pollen in North Greece, where the, uh, we have Eelkor's core, of course, from one sample to the next, we get these extreme drops in, in temperature in the sea, so this SL21. All this is low resolution, and the main thing is to, uh, as, as put forward by Ilko and Mayeski and other people, um, is that we have a, a very high correlation between the dust in Greenland and the temperature drop. So this is our starting point. No? Uh, here I, I want to show you a, the mechanism as it was recognized, I think that we call it the modern analog, uh, Ritter on the 31st of January. Here's the Black Sea. You, you can't see the cold winds, the cold air coming in, but you can see the, the clouds forming over the Black Sea. No? Then it'll switch in a minute. We'll go into the EG. You can already see it coming here. No? We can actually, this is sort of a, an animation. We can actually see the, the mechanism. No? There's turbulation here, then the cold winds go here. They, they can pick up uh, moisture. We can see the clouds. We can't see the cold winds. They, they actually go into the Thessalian plains, perhaps protected on this side, perhaps the Turkish coast is protected, but I mean, this is only one, one event a few days, uh, what is it, two years ago or something. No? Um, then the whole thing goes slap bang onto Crete, turns over and goes all the way to the Levant. So we, we really have got here uh, the, the demonstration, this corresponds pretty exactly, I was, I love this, this film. It, it corresponds to the mechanism. We can see it, it, it is at work today. Um, so, yeah, then it stops, of course. And then there's two possibilities. No. Here's Crete, either. There's a lot of snow or no snow. I, I, was, I like this sort of picture. I asked our archaeobotanist, what happens if you drive, if you get very cold air onto the vegetation, onto the crops, and you know, she said it'll be dry frozen. It would be, you know. uh, the alternative, then of course the plants have difficulties, but if we have a lot of snow, you know, 10 centimeters, 20, then the uh, crops will be quite happy, they'll be sort of protected, but the animals will have problems, so we may have a, an asymmetry in our records. You know? And uh, so uh, this corridor actually exists, as I think we can interpret it in this manner, all the way you know, over the Ukrainian plain. No? We have here the grass step of the forest step, and this is exactly where these cold winds come in. And what was it, two or three years ago, I was looking for all the impact of, of all the different events. No? 
I didn't find really much convincing for myself in the Ukraine. I think there may be an explanation for this. It's sort of that the people are adapted to it anyway. And I'm talking about Kokoteni Tripoli, the fourth calibrated millennium ne, here. So I couldn't find anything. There's a huge amount of the settlements expand. They are painted. Kokoteni Tripoli has such wonderful painting. Uh, and it's, you find the same stuff in China, but that's a different story. Uh, essentially, we may even have a cultural border here. I call it geo bioclimatic archaeological border. Ne? This is where we're, I think we can see the climatic impact. But that's not our story today. Ne? Uh, then two years ago, I was very, uh, really lucky to, to meet uh, uh, Toby uh, in Frankfurt in, a, <clears throat> in, in Cologne. He held us a paper. This is his PhD. He's, he was studying the outbreaks of polar air masses during certain winters. No? And this was all statistical processing. And he's, I'm very happy he sent me the picture. Essentially, the, we have the high pressure here. And what we see, this is of one week, the next four, over four weeks. And you, all of a sudden, you get this out from, directly from the polar reserve. It bubbles out. No? And it sort of sits there north of the Himalaya. No? Then the West cities come and blow it all the way over. Pacific and over to America. No? And I think this is just so wonderful to see. We can actually, so perhaps even, but uh, please criticize this. I can imagine that we have a low pressure coming of squeezing. So we need a mecha meteorological mechanism. We, have to, we could actually squeeze out this cold air bubble. No? But it, essentially, it goes to the east. No? And we're talking about the west. No? And then uh, what I was so very fascinated is that there are actually two, according to his results, there are two corridors for the outbreak of cold polar air masses. The one goes to the east and the other goes to the west. So this is where my knowledge stops. But, but uh, I, I would say there are, uh, with this sort of result, you can see of an animation of the dust going east. No? Um, <clears throat> I looked at China, see, of course, because this is where the signal should be stronger than in the west, because if it goes there all the time, then we should be able to find it. And I, I, I stumbled over an article, a paper in the Holocene by Hui. They collected all the historical, many, many, really thousands of documents from northeast China. Here's the potassium up here. No? And I wanted to really uh, sort of look at the question, if we have these nice peaks, can we expect, is this where we should look in the archaeological record? Because no? I don't like these smooth curves. And I was, so uh, it turned out, yes, we can actually find them. No? In, uh, if you have the N is here, the, a, a certain number of, of regions or, or towns where you can find this all the way back 30. This dust storm, 1523, and the other one here, it's a double one. These are the two strongest dust storms ever documented in China in the last 500 years. And yes, wonderful. They correlate with the, to the two strongest peaks in, in Majewski's 1997 um, potassium records. No? So that's, that's a good start, no? because I'll show you why I was looking at this. No? Uh, we'll go back quickly just to Lake Jinghai up, in the, up on the uh, Chinese Lus Plateau. Here's the... Chinese, it's 4,000 meters up, no? and um, perhaps we can find the dust up there as well. No, yes, indeed, just recently there's a record. Uh, uh, here's the potassium record, but I'm not too convinced of all. This is a matter of age modeling. Can we see the little ice age? This is the dust fraction, the larger, the, the heavier dust, which is blue. But I think with a bit of luck, I'm looking for these proxies all the time. I, I hopefully have found one, unless it's self-fulfilling profits. I mean, we have two little pigs here, and it, it looks nice. OK. No? Uh, collecting records. Because, why am I collecting these records? Because I really want to know where to look. Because if we're, if we're looking on a scale of 1200 BC or 1100 or 1000, it could be we're looking in the wrong point. No? I mean, uh, systems, archaeological systems react very fast. This is what Lee then also did to, to study the, the usefulness of these very strong peaks. We've just now solved the question. It's probably for, if we can find them in China, so we can do a lot of Chinese climate archaeology. But it's not in the West, not in the East Mediterranean. He collected from, I don't know, dozens of <clears throat> hundreds of records from the Levant, Anatolia, Aegean, plague and famine, severe droughts and winters, and this variability. Mm -hmm. you know, Yes, and what do they do? They actually sit right next to, here's the interval, 1550 to 1610, a wonderful concentration. It is right next to the GIF2 peaks. Yes, wonderful. It doesn't work. We can't use these peaks in the EMIT. 
And also we can't, if you look in the Ice Age, Middle Ice Age, the Spur of Minimum and Monde Minimum, they're also outside of our historical documentation. I've now come to the conclusion, okay, this is not that, not that. It seems we have two rapid climate change corridors in this sim simplified approach. Ne? And I, I've, I've now come to the, a bit to the idea that, well, perhaps it's not even rapid climate change. If we look at the timing here, 1550 or six, I mean, just, uh, what is it, 70 years ago or 50 years earlier, uh, America was discovered from European perspective, but of course then the American microbes and bacteria, they discovered Europe by, by way of all the shipping which was expanding, and that time perhaps this is one of the regional uh, impacts of the American biosphere coming over to us. I, I, don't, I really don't know. No? Um, <clears throat> so let's now go into the archaeological component. Uh, starting around, yes, say 1200, no? we have all these sites destroyed. This is just a map put together by no? uh, Interesting, El, El Hath, there's a question mark of perhaps even a tsunami. We have earthquakes. I'm going to go into this in a minute. You, you know the sites as well. So we'll start off with 1200. What I'm really getting at at the moment is I have no. I can't see any sort of really necessity no, to have climate as a climate background the, around the 1200 events because there were so many other things going on. If we look at it in terms of signal scales, we'll, we probably wouldn't, if there is climate, we wouldn't find it. No. Uh, first of all, we have earthquakes of this type. No. I'm going to show you uh, the, um, the earthquake in Troy in just in a moment. No. It's, it's really a wonder that these sites survive at all if you have so many. If you go to, to, to Mycenae right in the, the Leuven Tor, the line, is there, there's an earthquake fault here, right? You can, you can sort of put your finger in it. No? They'll have earthquakes all the time. No? Um, so, um, looking now here, we have major earthquakes, the complete destruction of many, many sites here. In the Argolis, in the southern parts of the Aegean, uh, many of the sites, the big sites, stop and it's very difficult to analyze because they're sort of taken apart by following generations. We have earthquakes here. Okay. No. Um, the, it's interesting though that we're getting, I'm looking at this event, I'm, I'm getting away from the 1200. I, I can see continuity change and continuity in Troy, but let's go in, let's look here around 1000. No. Um, 1000 BC. No. Then I've put together, from, I'm sorry, I, I can't cite all this stuff. There are so many papers and of colleagues who have helped here, no? but if you look on a general scale, all the way to North Greece, you'll see something around here. Uh, I wouldn't even bother so much about the dates. I call it protogeometric in the meantime. It's the start of the protogeometric, but there are two very large sites which exemplify what's really going on. Thessaloniki, Tumba, here's the, the high resolution chronology made by pottery synchronisms. I'm calling it high resolution. It is. No? Uh, they're, they both stop. This is the, the top here. They, they, they both stop for around 1,050 or 1,000. No? Here's Castanas. It also stops around this. So, so two of them, we have very big sites. They uh, sort of stop and are abandoned. And uh, then comes the Iron Age, and then it gets complicated. No? Uh, let's go into the earthquake. Let's go now to, to Troy now. No? First of all, the earthquake is, if we, have to, if we take Troy 6, this is the citadel. If, in, in our imagination, we could perhaps make the lower town a bit a bit less densely, I mean, yeah, a bit less densely built up. But uh, around 1200, the first wave of the earthquake, you can see here. Here's the Troy Six Wall. Here's the earthquake. So uh, zoomed in a bit. No. After that, we have a major fire. Troy Seven A. Please don't be uh, distracted. This is truly. This is a, another phase of Troy Six. This is. We, we could say Aegean, Mycenaean, if you like. But then we get the, the transition to 7b. I'm going to go into this in detail. But we can see the earthquake. Okay. No? Uh, at Troy, nothing much happens. 7a is the same as 6. They build, rebuild the site on an equally large scale. There is nothing I would... If I'm looking for climate impact around 1200, Yes, the culture changes, but the uh, sort of it goes down a bit if you want, if you want to quantify culture and up and down. <coughs> it's not really convincing. No? Yeah. Just, just so you get into the site a bit, what, here's the official Troy chronology made by Manfred Kaufmann. Yes, around a thousand, we have the desertion of the site, and this is a long discussion. No? First of all, I just want to show you the data, what's, what's happening here. We get these small cell houses in 7b, buckel keramik. No? Here's the Troy 6 wall. In 7b, it's sort of closed up. This is not a, a, a Bronze Age fortification. It's the foundation trench of the Hellenistic temple. No? And 
I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you the, the complexity of the whole site. I mean, you can, it gets actually quite simple if you sort of bubble into it a bit. No? Uh, let's we'll just go into this different periods. No? Uh, first of all, we'll start with the, the Athena temple. When Schliemann came to try, the Troy 6 was already gone anyway, so he didn't have to destroy it. It was already destroyed by these people. No? Um, um, this is the, the foundation trench we just saw. is one of these, yeah, the foundation wall. So, if we go back a bit earlier, his Troy too is a little bit simplified, a major fortification. Then we have here the, 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 big, the big buildings that are centralized. <coughs> and, uh, in settlement, you know, with different entrances, okay, but that's not our period. Yes, and I've, I've left away Troy 3, 4, 5. It's, I haven't digitized it. It's the most complicated at all, and there's so little. No? Uh, but in Troy 6, we know a lot. You can see the middle has gone. It, uh, Schliemann didn't only by himself, that, that was the Hellenistic uh, engineers did that. But you have the major ward and all sorts of radially organized houses going into the middle which has been removed. Ne? But let's go on a bit into the, into the next one. Yeah. The, the green ones now, we are now moving into the seven. This is still Troy. Six is a continuation of the same culture, if you want. You can see here, for example, the towers expanded. We have here a lot of architecture going on. There's all sorts of things happening. And then comes the big change in culture, the buckle keramic and, and this sort of stuff. This is what it now looks like. Ne? You can actually see in 7b, no? there, there, there are many, many houses. There's a lot going on in Troy. I've left away the Troy 6 wall because it's still standing. And it, it was built early. They're using it still. No? And then, uh, so uh, if we look, what is really happening at the end of Troy? What happens in this perhaps desertion phase, which is perhaps correlated with the 3ka? No? I wanted to show you the really three typical things. First of all, buckle keramic is handmade. Uh, here's the buckle. No? Then we have the autostats, vertical stones, mainly in the foundation. This is the second criteria, and the protogeometric pottery. And I've just asked uh, Stefan Blum, he's working on the final volumes of Troy. Is this terminology 7b1 to 3, is this still established? He said no. no. In the final volume, they're not going to use uh, uh, 7b3 anymore, just b1 and b2. As you can see, it really, that's, I think, quite sensible. You can define uh, archaeological periods or subdivisions by pottery, by architecture. No? Uh, it's, it really, it is a bad idea to just def define it by a certain pottery, type of pottery, so 7B. But up to now, it's really only defined by this. No? Um, and then I, um, I'm going to sort of switch through now to show you a few pictures. Where can we find 7B3 or B2? No? I'm going to go into the sanctuary, the square D9, squares E8 and E9 in the well. Have I got time? Is it OK? Mm -hmm. Am I running short? No. OK, good. Then I'll go a bit slower. No. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I can't show you every single <laughs> protogeometric shirt. I'd like to show you the situation. Here's a Roman temple. This is the sanctuary in the west. Yeah. Somewhere in here, down here, is the 7B excavations, the, the, the running excavations, or the now completed excavations. This is what they look like when they're running. You can see for me how difficult it is to, just to show you. I'd like to show you where every single shirt comes from. I can't. No? I can show you certain spots, and they're somewhere here, and some of these walls are 7B1, B2, B3. This is what it looks like. No? But you can see it's spotty and patchy. No? Um, square D9 is a bit easier, more easy to explain. Here's the Schliemann Trench. Troy 2 is in, on the other side. Here's the outer fortification in Troy 6. We're going to excavate here now. No? Uh, I'll go right down here from the, from the excavations, this is square D9. What we can see here at the back is the Troy 6 wall. In front of this, these, uh, these uh, wall, wall segments are the green. This is, I think, 7B2. It is underlying the protogeometric terrace here. This is the terrace. This is all we can really see. No? This is the youngest phase architecture we have in this square of the protogeometric. And if you ask me, that's not really much. No, it, of course it's not much. This is what we have. And somewhere in here is the pottery. No? Uh, I'll go into that again a bit. No? We can go deeper. No? We have the wall here. No? And here is the, the architecture. You find shirts here and then two or three of them. No? 
even this, it's how difficult it is even to date these structures. Ne? What Manfred Kaufmann points out, let's go back a minute, but I can't see it myself. On this picture, he, he comments on one of his publications that you can see a white layer, 10 centimeter layer of white dust, the result of long-term decay of the limestone wall, but I can't see it. It must be there, because if Kaufmann writes it, it is there somewhere. The point is that the we need arguments for the settlement to be deserted. And there were many colleagues who say it never was deserted. But what I can actually show you, I think, is that if it was continued, there wasn't much there. No? That is perhaps the main point. No? So we'll leave this deep excavation. We'll now go into squares E8 here in the south. Yes, here Troy 7 is much, much better left over. You can see how high the walls are. Perhaps you can see it here, autostats. There are different phases in here. You can see how high the, the entrance is. These are the houses. Yeah. In 7B, they are standing as Dörpfeld left them or Schliemann left them. They're, they are quite high up still. No? This is what the situation looks like here the, with the modern excavations. We have a whole sequence of, of houses here. No? Uh, then we can... Uh, uh, this, this is not the actual end. It's sort of one phase before the end. No? And then, of course, here and there we find proto-geometric pottery. You have it inside these rooms, sort of the last level, if you excavate this, sort of at the top a bit, you find a bit of proto-geometric, and then comes Hellenistic, and it's mixed. Yeah? <clears throat> um, we'll go now to an, a very important uh, part of the, of, the, of the site, of the citadel here is in the east. It is the bastion, which is actually a fortified well. No? You can see here, what I was going to point out to you here, is that, yeah, of course, the different walls, but mainly what is, there's a sort of a, a, a starting rubble layer research. Now, what is a rubble layer? You find them at all sorts of positions here. This is what it looks like. This is the rubble layers. You can see walls have a certain size stones, but this rubble or tumble, it's sometimes called. No? People say it's an earthquake. Other people say it's this and that, and it's, is it the site deserted? Just so um, I can't decide for you, please decide yourself if we ever can. Um, I, I think we can have, what type of stone is this? They are very small. If you look at the walls here, the 7B walls, they have sort of an outer, outer case and an inner case. This is quite typical for this type of, and then you put the small stones in between to fill up. No? And of course, if you then rework or reuse, recycle the, this type of stone, you take the big ones and leave the small ones. So this is a, could be a recycling. Anyway, it's the last we can see of Troy 7B, if you want, B3. No? The well is very interesting. What is a, I think an interesting argument. Here's the well, here's the excavation. Uh, perhaps most important to recognize is that Dörpfeld already started digging into it. And of course, we only have the do historical documentation. At the very top of the well, we have the proto-geometric pottery. No? Of course, if you have pottery in a well, that means the well is not in use anymore. So this dates the sort of the, the end of the site. It is a wonderfully built architecture. Uh, you can see here there's a there's a, a channel coming out here. This is from 7A. So if 7A, I mean, they're working on the water system, even still in 7A, around 1200. Wonderful. No? Of course, this goes out in use as well. Here's the deep sounding. For, for our period, it's not really interesting what's at the bottom, but the top is interesting. I mean, there is proto-geometric pottery, a shirt or two around the top. Derpfeld writes this. No? So coming to an end now to, 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 to round up, no? we have here the, uh, if I may say, at least high resolution, or at least high density uh, potassium record as an index for the strength of the Siberian high. No? and its expansion. We also have in Paul Majewski's uh, glacial chemical elements, we have the chlor and the, uh, the sodium. No, I don't know what that means, but it's just, a, it's, it's, it's essentially, please correct me, it is, uh, as I say, sea, it's the sea salt that directly being blown into the ice core, just salt. No? Here, this is the atmospheric record. So there's something happening, say plus minus a decade or so, between 1050 and 1000. And that is, as far as I know, the, the dating and the observations in Troy. This is, this is actually the end of the, at least in Troy, the end of the early Bronze Age. No? So uh, just to put it together, we have the fortified well, it's out of use. No? The central organization has gone, the system is going down again. Yeah? Sort of something that buckle keramic. No? is coming in and autostats in the sites getting, the Unterstadt doesn't exist in the same size. The very last pottery is proto-geometric, however we define it. 
I've purposely put here 7b2, 3 and 1, sort of spread it. No? They could be only 10 years if they exist at all. I don't want to be sort of self-fulfilling because I could put it exactly onto this interval no? on whatever we define as dark age. Oh, so that's why I put this plus minus 50. It works nicely. And if you want to find this event anywhere in the Aegean, please look for the earliest, early, early protogeometric this is every single shirt from Troy of the protogeometric. There's been a, 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 a big study by Pavel uh, Hinnila. This is, he was working there in the Scherbengarten. Oh, uh, may I have a look here? This is all he has, all the pottery. But we can see by the qualities made by um, the interesting thing is, I would argue, this is the system on the way up again. Because these are imports probably from North Macedonia, from North Greece, you know, with traditions into the down south, but um, so I'll put everything together. We have troubles that surely begin around 1200 earthquakes, sea people, disruption, or whatever you want. Hittite uh, uh, introduction even of new military technology, swords. But no, the system, at least Troy, representative for the system, and all the other sites show the same thing. Around a thousand later, 200 years later, then it's going down, but then it, the system stops or is potentially deserted or preliminarily, or at least the population is not there anymore. It's around a thousand, you know? and it's interesting, it correlates with the rapid climate change near the dust. You know? uh, uh, it is actually, I, I would guess it's just when the system is recovering, it's just going up again, because you know? otherwise you wouldn't get these wonderful imports. Thanks very much.